Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Connor. I'm the editorial director for the Northwest Environmental Education Foundation. Um, I've known Norm Buskey for about 15 years and am, am lucky enough to have had him as a mentor when I was studying Hanford groundwater problems as a, a young and somewhat more hairful, though not a lot more hairful, researcher at the Hanford Education Action League in the 80s. And um, I really consider myself fortunate to have had him as a mentor. I have always found him to be a profoundly difficult act to follow. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure whether we can top that, but we're going to try. The topic of our panel discussion this morning is Hanford time bombs. In the summer of 1956, about 11 years after the startup of Hanford, Hanford managers discovered they had a little problem. They were about to start operating the world's newest and largest plutonium processing plant, the Purex plant. The problem was they didn't have enough space in the large underground tanks to uh, handle the liquid high-level waste that Purex would create. And they needed about three to four years worth of storage capacity to start the plant. Their solution was, was simple in its elegance. They started dumping high-level waste on the ground in August of 1956 to create the <laughs> tank space they needed to operate the Purex plants. Um, they dug holes in the ground, and they called these holes specific retention basins. But the word retention is very misleading. The waste simply percolated into the 200-foot layer of Pasco gravels um, by the 200 East area where the Purex plant was being built. By the time they were through, some 9 million gallons of liquid high-level waste had been dumped onto the ground. These wastes didn't just disappear, of course. And one of the big questions today is where did it go and where is it going? <clears throat> and how will this and other past practices at Hanford come back to haunt us and whether they will? Uh, to help us try to deal with this potential Hanford time bomb this morning and address this issue are Glenn Spain from the Northwest, Re Glenn is the Northwest Regional Director for the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen Associations. Dirk Dunning from the Oregon Department of Energies, he's a Hanford nuclear specialist, and Tom Woods, who's an engineer for the Yakima, engine, uh, the Yakima Indian Nation. Uh, I think we'll begin with Glenn and give his remarks and go down the line here and then uh, get going with, uh, with some questions on our topic. Thanks. Good morning. I'll do my best to uh, follow some tough acts uh, with sufficient amounts of coffee, I can probably manage it. Uh, our organization, uh, the Pacific uh, Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations, is a commercial fishing trade association. I'm also the program director for its Institute for Fisheries Resources, which is a very unusual organization. It is a, a in-your-face, aggressive environmental organization run entirely by commercial fishermen. Where we get involved in this, of course, is that the Columbia River has historically been and still is the most productive salmon river system in the world. The key to that productivity is the Hanford Reach. Now, salmon are very highly migratory, so the impact of whatever happens in the Hanford Reach and whatever happens in the river system, whether it be good or bad, moves up and down the coast in dramatic ways. Roughly 25 to 30 percent of all salmon harvested in southeast Alaska come from the Columbia. Uh, comparable figures uh, in British Columbia. Uh, there are international issues because of the Pacific Salmon Treaty and commitments made by this country to protect, protect and conserve Columbia River fish. Salmon is a multi-billion dollar industry, not millions, billion dollar industry, and supports a number, a large number of communities up and down the coast. Any serious pollution problem in the Columbia River would have not only biological problems, the hazard itself, but the public's perception of the safety of West Coast seafood. 
Now, it's not just salmon. Salmon originate, uh, many of them, in the Hanford Reach, but the river system itself supports many other fisheries. There's a multi-million dollar sturgeon fishery downriver. Sturgeon also can bioaccumulate uh, radionuclides and other pollutants. It's not just the radioactive component, but there's a lot of other nasties out there that are pollutants in their own right. There is a $50 million crab fishery. The nursery for the West Coast crab fishery, largest West Coast crab fishery, is right there at the mouth of the Columbia River. And guess where? the Corps of Engineers was planning until we fought them in court and recently won. Uh, their dredge spoils from virtually everywhere in the Columbia River is right there in the crab nursery. Those are laced with PCBs, laced with toxic, and laced with radioactive nucleides. Other fisheries include a, a ground fish fishery out in the plume, which extends quite a ways into the ocean from the Columbia River. And then there's the sport fishing industry, which is a major industry. Hundreds of millions of dollars is brought into this region because of sport fishing. And on top of that, the tribal treaty fishery, which is an important, vitally important resource for, for the, the tribal interests. Now, Don Sampson um, gave you a bunch of figures, and I want to just underscore a few of his. The Fall Chinook from the Hanford Reach is about 80% of the natural spawning fall Chinook in the entire river system. This is a vital resource. So not only are we, as commercial fishermen and as businesses, dependent on a healthy river system and clean water, vitally interested in the health of the fish, but in the health of the reach itself, which is why we've been a strong proponent for the protection of the reach as a wild and scenic river system. Now, in addition to that, of course, is the clean water issue itself for all of the people of the river. There are many, many users of the river, not just commercial fishermen, but major cities. I'd like to, since this is a, 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 a fundamental um, meeting and an important watershed meeting for a lot of people who have been working on these issues for a long time, <coughs> I want to emphasize a little bit of political reality. To date, the Hanford issue has been seen by the public and even by some of its proponents as primarily an environmental issue. It is that, but it is also a jobs issue. There are hundreds of thousands of jobs up and down the coast dependent on the health of our fisheries. If the confidence in that uh, high quality seafood is lost, a lot of people will suffer. It is a clean water issue for everyone who drinks water from anywhere in this basin. And that's virtually everybody. It is a public health issue. Now, we've seen some figures. It is bad, certainly not optimal, but it could get much, much, much worse unless steps are taken within the next five years, which our people here, all of us, have some control over making sure that that happens. It is a tribal treaty rights issue for obvious reasons, as Don Sampson and others have, have indicated. It is an international issue. There should be some British Columbia fishermen. There should be the Minister of Environment from British Columbia here concerned about this issue. We should bring this constantly to their attention. It is a quality of life issue. Absolutely. We do not want to live in the most radioactive parts of the country. We don't want to live in a place where everything we do from uh, the, the river system itself is suspect. And it is a moral obligation issue. How we have dealt in the past with industrialization, nuclear issues, and their impact on fish and wildlife and on river systems upon which we all depend for our lives is a sorry, sorry uh, uh, state of things. And the churches are here. I see a number of people who are from various religious denominations who are very concerned and increasingly concerned about the audacity, the aggression that we've been uh, guilty of in dealing with these natural resources. <clears throat>
in our case, um, we're certainly part of that equation. And we have been reaching out to many of the organizations in this room, including, by the way, co-sponsoring this conference. Uh, we will continue reaching out. We invite you all, whether you consider yourself an environmentalist or not, to realize that the issue is a very, very much broader issue than just environmentalists versus or with or whatever. It is a fundamental issue for the future of this region. And certainly we're involved in uh, working with you. Keep in mind that the commercial fishing industry in this country is a $153 billion industry. Put together, I mean, we're fragmented, but when we work together on issues like this, we can provide some political clout as an ally. So keep that in mind. And I'm doing my best, certainly, to alert our people, our industry, to this problem and move them forward in coalitions with many organizations in this room to, first off, protect the wild and scenic uh, uh, reach uh, under Wild and Scenic Act. Second off, get a few well-placed kicks and a few well-deserved butts in D.C. and elsewhere uh, to move forward. We do not have to have more studies. We don't all have all the technology we need, but we know some things we can realistically do now. But certainly Congress needs to hear this. Uh, certainly uh, Senator Wyden is very much on our side on these issues and also very sensitive to fisheries issues. Uh, we need to make sure that we elect people who are sensitive to this issue in the upcoming election. And we need to work together, absolutely. Because combined, I think our, our voices will always be heard. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Dirk Denning with the uh, State of Oregon Office of Energy. Uh, for several years, we were the Department of Energy, and that both served us and hindered us in some ways. It served us in that it confused the U.S. Department of Energy to the point that they gave us badges that looked just like theirs. That's changed. Um, there's several points I wanted to talk with you today about, but the first thing I want to do is thank a number of folks. Particularly, I want to thank Tim Connors, to my right, Norm Buskey, some folks with the Union of Concerned Scientists, the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, Dr. Richard Belsey, uh, Ralph Pat, who's here in the audience with us, and a number of others who you know, I won't run down the long list. But the reason for it goes kind of as follows. When I came on board with the state, I had the great good fortune to work with Ralph Pat, who's a geohydrologist for the state at the time. And so he gave me a fair leg up in understanding what was happening at Hanford. But there were a lot of things that you really had to go to the documents to find out what was happening. And as I've gone through the years, one of the things I found is I came to some conclusions about what was happening at Hanford and what the problems were. And those were without, for the most part, having people tell me what was there, other than in the geohydrology areas. But in going through the documents, one of the things I found is a generation of people back in the 1970s who found the very same problems that later I found, that a generation after them that Tim Connors and Norm Buskey found, that a generation after them that Dick Belsey and Ralph Pat found, and others. These problems are not that hard to find. And they keep getting found by people outside the complex as different groups move through. And through this entire time, we've had others who've been involved who've been very much at the forefront. People like my good friend Russell Jim that have been a consistent force to try to make sure that this problem is addressed and understood by everyone. The second thing I want to do is talk a little bit about the river. We have the river just outside the window, which is very nice to see. And everybody here knows it as the Columbia. But for a long time, its name was known by another name. It was the Enchiwana. And I apologize for brutalizing the pronunciation. This river is a vital lifeblood to the Northwest. And threats to the river are things that we must take very seriously. At Hanford, you know, the, the topic of this panel is time bombs. And I think of that a little bit differently, a little more like the folks in, say, the Department of Defense might, where they do things called threat assessments. What are the threats to the river? And I see several of them. 
and I'm going to talk about two in particular, and there's several others that I won't. You know, there are ones like the plutonium finishing plant and some of the facilities in the 300 area, like the 324B cell, where there's several million curies of radioactive cesium very near the town of Richland in a building that's not earthquake stable. There's tons of plutonium in the plutonium finishing plant and many hundreds of kilos in portions of the building that are not earthquake stable. Those are large threats, but they pale compared to some others. The two that I want to talk about, the first is K-basins. Uh, in 1993, we received at the Oregon Office of Energy a notification of an unusual event at Hanford. They did an analysis, it seems, out at one of the two K basins right along the river that you saw in the video, and they found that they had a large level of plutonium in a section of the K basin called the Sandfelter Backwash Pit. When they analyzed it and they looked at how much material was in the Sandfelter Backwash Pit, they calculated there was almost two kilograms of plutonium, about four pounds in the backwash pit. Well, that struck me as very odd how you could have that much plutonium that's in sand and debris that's in the basin in the open waters. And so I started digging. And one of the things that I found was that the basin had a whole lot of debris in it. Uh, as the years went by, it became clear that the basin has about seven inches of, of dirt and sand and uranium oxide and other things in the bottom. About half of that is sand, the other half is break down products from the uranium fuel, the corrosion of the fuel. So when you hear people talking about the uranium fuel being damaged, that's a very polite term. The fuel is rotting. And it's rotting much more quickly as time goes by. It's an ever-increasing thing. And when I looked at the problem, one of the things I found was that, based on my own history coming out of uh, training sailors how to run nuclear submarines, that there's a real concern about uranium because it's pyrophoric. It'll burn spontaneously under some conditions in air. And one of the things that concerned me was that here we have a building built many decades ago that is just a lightweight aluminum structure with steel framework. It has open gaps to the outside world. It's open ventilated. There's no filtration on the building. And yet here we have 2,000 metric tons of uranium fuel with a thin cladding of metal over it. And that fuel's been shoved out of the reactor and damaged badly coming out of the reactor, and it's been left in storage for over a decade. And it's corroding, and it's leaving this layer of grunge in the bottom of the basins. And then when I looked at it and realized that this uranium is there, I started wondering what the basin design looked like. So I dug through the drawings and found out one wall of the basin is not a part of the basin. It's actually part of the reactor building, and it's not joined to the reactor building. They're just poured up against each other. Well, coming out of the semiconductor industry, we worried a lot about earthquakes and building designs to make sure that the buildings could survive. And so one of the things we did is intentionally decoupled some buildings so they didn't shake together. But we also knew that that meant that in an earthquake, they would move separately and they could move apart. So we had to do very careful designs to make sure that the piping would survive the movement of the two buildings. In the case of the basins, it's likely that in a large earthquake, they too would move apart. That creates a very large hole in a nice water-filled basin, and you can imagine what then happens to that water level. Well, if the water drains, once the water reaches the top of the fuel, the radiation levels become absolutely unbelievable. You couldn't get anywhere near the building if the fuel is exposed. But worse than that, the fuel is highly radioactive, and so it will heat up quickly. And over a period of days, uh, back in 1993, we had discussions with the Department of Energy, and I pointed this out, and I received a memo from a gentleman named Putoff with the U.S. Department of Energy. And his response in terms of my concerns about the heating of the fuel and the potential for it to ignite was to say that they had looked at it and that the worst case was that if the pool did drain, the fuel over two days would heat up and it would at worst case reach a temperature 20 degrees Fahrenheit below the auto-ignition temperature. That's for pure uranium. This is damaged uranium. It burns at lower temperatures. Theirs was the concern. If somehow this basin were to ever drain, you could potentially have 2,000 metric tons of uranium fuel in the K East Basin ignite. It has in it upwards of 30 million curies of long live radionuclides. It has three tons of plutonium in it. It's very hard to put out a burning metal fire whether uranium or magnesium. And if the radiation fields are so intense you can't get near the building, we have a tremendous threat.
it didn't take too much longer than in talking with some of the staff of the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board back in Washington, D.C. to convince them this was a serious problem. Coming out of that, Terra O'Toole's office did a study you know, across the complex called the Spent Fuel Working Group Report, and it found the same problems all over the place. And it scared the DOE managers. And so at the time in the press, you'll see Tom Grumbly and Secretary O'Leary talking about the two things that caused them not to sleep at night. One was the Hanford tanks and the potential for a tank explosion. The other was the K-basins. And they began immediately an environmental impact statement to see what they could do about the problem. And they went through a whole range of alternatives. And if you read that document, one of the things you'll see is the scenario I just described is not in there. Because the design basis earthquake, the worst earthquake that they postulate, was 1% in energy less than it would take to cause the failure of the basins. Now, at the same time, they knew that problem was there and was real. And so they worked very aggressively to get a program in place to get the fuel out of the basins. And DOE deserves great plaudits for doing that. Perhaps some, some criticism for not being up forthright about what the problem was. But they did aggressively move to get the fuel re problem resolved. Now, Westinghouse then became the lead on that program. And John Fulton with Westinghouse was the person involved. And John Fulton did a wonderful job. Today, there's a lot of criticism of Westinghouse by those that came after, Floor Daniel and Duke. I'm here to tell you, Westinghouse did a very good job in their time. They very aggressively involved the public, including the press, John Stang and the folks at the Oregonian and, and others, Jim Long, and all of us in the, in the stakeholder community. And they broached what the problems were, the real problems, and they got on with it. There were a lot of problems that they knew they didn't understand. There were things about how flammable the fuel was and what would happen if you dried it out and how all the technical aspects would work. And they were working to resolve those. And then the contract change in Westinghouse was replaced. In that change, there were a number of things that happened and delays, as always happens in a con contract change. Now there's a new team in place, and they've stumbled a couple of times. And they appear to be a very good outfit from the outset, but then they stumbled badly. and. People questioned that rather severely. And they seem to be getting it back together. And there's a program now in place to try to get this fuel moved very quickly. Now, they want to be very careful they do it right because the danger is still there. And even in moving it, the danger is still there to some degree. But it's less than in leaving it. That's the first problem. The second problem I'm going to talk to you about is, is a segue to Tom Woods. And it has to do with the groundwater veto zone. In the threats to the river, we now live in the quiet time. In the 1960s, among the other things you heard about the potential for shutting down the plants, in the mid-60s was the maximum production at Hanford, and the levels of radioactivity in the river got to be quite high. There's a memo over in the reading room that's very enlightening that talks about the river at that time having levels of radioactivity that by today's standards, the entire river was three times the drinking water standard today the whole river. In addition, there's a memo there that talks about a proposal to close the entirety of the Columbia River to fishing because the fish are too radioactive. And that was part of the efforts then that led to doing things to better treat the effluent water and to limit some of the reactor operations so that they didn't have to go there. The river was hot. Today, a lot of that has decayed away and is gone. There are things in the sediments, and those are problems, including behind the dams. But we're still in the quiet time, because mostly what we have is just the upstream water flowing by, with some seepage from end springs and other places. But we also have, as Norm Buskey pointed out, and others have since then, and, and the folks with the expert panel have seen, this problem of a huge plume of radioactive material from tank leaks, from the intentional disposal of high-level waste into the soil to the tune of half a million gallons, from the intentional disposal of overflow from the tanks when they took out the cesium and strontium and uranium to the tune of several hundred million gallons directly to the soil, and then from the tank leaks of something measured well above a million gallons and over a million curies, and if Steve Agnew with Los Alamos' estimate is correct, probably over 5 million curies and 5 million gallons would be a good guess. Those materials are moving through the, slowly through the soil. The models at Hanford say that it can't move. They've said that since the 50s, but they're moving, as you've seen from Casey Rood and from John Broder 
as uh, Ralph Pat described it, one of the problems that we have is we have a data gap in the first 130 feet that we don't have a lot of data there. Below 130 feet down to groundwater in this Vado zone in the dirt, we have the Grand Canyon of data gaps. There's almost no data. We don't know what's down there and we don't know where it's at. We don't know when it's going to hit the water. And so then we come to the Groundwater Vado Zone project and the efforts there. And with that, I'll turn you over to Tom. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Uh, end a, a, um, a career at Hanford that began in 1981. Today is my retirement day. So uh, please bear with me. Um, I, uh, I apologize. I don't know everything. I get uh, mixed up on some of the numbers. Uh, but I'll try to be as correct as I can about numbers, and I'd like to, to end today, uh, that is my career today, uh, with um, a bit of an appraisal uh, of where I see Hanford and, um, and uh, why some of the problems exist that are there, and what I uh, sincerely recommend you folks do about them. Uh, and you, you hold the secret to doing what needs to be done as I hope you see in a moment. I appreciate uh, Dirk setting me up because the first point of my notes here was to uh, begin to give you a perspective about Hanford. And you, it is important that you think about Hanford as a yesterday, a today, and a tomorrow. Yesterday was the operations period of Hanford. And large, as you've heard from many speakers, large quantities of radionuclides uh, escape from Hanford, most through the river, some through the air, but that was during the production operations days, and that happened primarily because of the design of the reactors that used the river water to cool them on a once-through process. And th there aren't any, of course, they, these were early reactors. This was the first in reactor design. There aren't any, there's nobody that builds reactors, designs reactors that way, and haven't for years. But these are old machines. And because of the nature of that design, there was heavy pollution to the river. Now, uh, you should not, I, I would encourage you not to get uh, unduly alarmed about the state of the river out here right now. Now, the reason for that is that most of what went into the river was short-lived and tended to be very soluble. So although the river was once, not long, long ago, was once in terrible shape, in my view, uh, that has pretty much done two things, washed out to sea, and secondly, the short-lived nature of the contaminants, it's pretty much gone. Now, there clearly is contamination left in the sediments. Where are the sediments? Well, sediments settle in slow water, holes, sloughs, behind dams. I wouldn't touch a fish caught behind McNary Dam for anything, particularly a bottom feeder fish. Okay. So there's sediments in the river, but, but uh, most of the way that all of us live, we don't get that close to the sediments in the river. So fundamentally, as Dirk said, today we're in a quiet time. Okay. Now quiet times are not the times to get panicky. Quiet times are times to very thoughtfully consider where we are and where we're going. And that's what I want to encourage you all to do. To give you some idea, now think back over the speakers you've heard, to give you some idea of perspective here, about 1%, probably less than 1%, of the chemicals and the radionuclides at Hanford have ever left Hanford. Now, let, me, let me stop and let that sink in. Of all of the, of the stories of serious concern that you've heard from all the speakers up here about contamination, that contamination has come from less than 1% of what's at Hanford and ever was at Hanford. This quiet time for reflection should be spent on who's making the decisions about what happens to the other 
And that's what I want to drill into your consciousness in the next, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, whatever, whatever I've got here. Who's making the decisions on what happens to the other 99%? Now, 99% of what? Well, some numbers have been tossed out, and uh, as a sidebar here, I want to encourage you to make a note to get a copy of a um, very thin little report that's being put together by a person that works for Battelle at uh, Pacific Northwest National Labs. And I, I was uh, asked to, uh, to edit a uh, pre-pub version of a draft of it. And it's, and it's a marvelous, it's a marvelous compilation of what is Hanford and what's there. And the individual has been at Hanford for a very long period of time, holds the concerns that I and you hold, and he wanted to get the story down. Look for Roy Gebhardt's report, which will be out within 30 days. And I'm going to quote, quote you a couple of numbers or three that I can remember from it. First of all, I want you to be aware, I want you to think like this. There are wastes at Hanford that uh, for simplicity's sake, I'll just say they're contained, or they're pretty much contained. They're in uh, boxes, 55-gallon drums, large storage tanks, but the wastes are more or less contained. Now, we know that a lot of the storage tanks are leaking, which brings me to the other category I want you to remember about Hanford, is there are wastes, large quantities of wastes that are not contained. They're in the soil, they're in the groundwater, or they've been there and now they're in the river or they were in the river and now they're out to sea and gone. But you have fundamentally the two categories of where the wastes are. They're contained or they're not contained. Now, reflect on what I just said relative to the decisions that are being made today about the other 99% of the waste. What's contained is more or less amenable to doing something about it. What's not contained, uh, what do we do about that? There, are, there are actually there are some technologies, but they're not very responsive. There are things like intercepting plumes and, and building barriers, very deep, very large barriers, uh, freezing the soil. We cannot ignore this stuff that's in the soil. It is a large fraction of the waste at Hanford. But that's not being addressed very well because nobody knows exactly how much is in the soil. A couple of numbers. Throughout the operations period of the reactors and the chemical processing plants, all the stuff, all the, all the byproducts from the processing, of course, wouldn't go in the tanks or in anything else. So the stuff that was lightly contaminated, the liquids, the chemicals, the water that was lightly contaminated was deliberately dumped into the soil, sometimes into wells that went directly into the groundwater, sometimes into holding ponds, but it was dumped in the soil. The number, 540 billion gallons of lightly contaminated fluids. 540 billion gallons of low-level waste directly into the soil. Not contained today, never was contained. How about high-level waste, the real bad stuff? Best estimate, 100 million gallons of high-level waste direct, dumped directly into the soil. Well, why in the world would anybody do that? Well, folks, there was war on, and the tanks were full. And then what do you do? I'm glad I wasn't working there then because um, as I'm going to uh, uh, elaborate here in a minute when we talk about obstacles to clean up, I really do the best I can to operate as a man of conscience. And if I had worked there then, dumping high-level waste into the soil would have been a real problem for me. And I don't know what I would have done. Okay? And I'm sure there were a lot of people there that were confronted with the same thing. But into the soil it went, 100 million gallons. Now, since then, leaky tanks, more has gone into the soil. But we know 100 million gallons plus that that's estimated to leak from the tanks has gone into soil. And the tanks I'm talking about are the tanks that hold the high-level waste. So, the, so those figures are, are very large. Well, where is this stuff? Well, it's somewhere between its point of insertion and 
the river or the ocean or somewhere in between. What do we do about that? Man, that's tough. Well, first of all, you got to know where it is. Then, depending on where it is, then you got to figure out what can be done about that. Point is, this is not an easy problem. The part of it that is the easiest is that that is contained. And given this perspective, I want to move on to a couple of other points, and then I want to come back to this when I, when I conclude about what is it that makes sense that should be done today. Okay. Remember that what it, you all, what DOE, what the collective group of all of us decide to do today, today's decisions on cleaning up this waste dictates tomorrow's effects. Today's decisions dictate tomorrow's effects. Now, what are the obstacles? Why aren't we getting on with this? Well, I, uh, uh, all, I work for Russell Jim. Uh, I'm a technical advisor to the Yakima Nation. Uh, what you're hearing from me is my personal views, as I said. Uh, they're not necessarily the Yakima Nation's views. Um, what credibility they have, I don't know, maybe not much. Um, I've spent 41 years in uh, professional engineering service. Uh, a great deal of it. I uh, was fortunate to be at uh, very high levels in, uh, in both industry and in, and in government. And um, so I've uh, got a lot of knots on the head and a lot of gray hair up there. Uh, I don't know if that qualifies me to have uh, a credibility on some of these um, assessments or not. But at any rate, I think there are two things, in my judgment, that are blocking progress today. One is self-serving agendas. The Hanford complex, maybe not all that different from the rest of our society. The people that work at Hanford have to be concerned about their families, they have to be concerned about what's on their resume, they have to be concerned about career progression. And those of you that have been around government knows that gets to be particularly convoluted. Okay? But folks, when you're concerned about yourself, you're not going to be very concerned about others. And when the others that you need to be concerned about are the fourth, the fifth, the ninth, the fortieth generation from now, then it's very easy not to be very concerned about them. Self-serving agendas are killing us. Oh, sorry, not us. My kids, your kids. In a word, Hanford has lost heart. Hanford does not have a heart for your grandkids. There is no passion there. Now, what I pray for is nightmares. Not for me, I've already got them. What I pray for is a lot of DOE people at headquarters and at Richland to start having nightmares. Okay? I want them to have a nightmare about a real cute little blonde, curly-headed girl that's their great-great-granddaughter. And she is the cutest thing that you ever saw. The only one problem, she doesn't have any arms. Okay? Her family lived and grew up in the Tri-Cities and stayed there. And who knows what they got exposed to, but somewhere along the line, uh, some chromosomes got altered. And this curly-headed little muffet doesn't have any arms. I want people to have nightmares about that. And I want the nightmare to go on, because you see, the rest of the nightmare is she didn't have any mother either, because her mother died of cancer. See? And her dad's sick and can't work either. Why? Oh, man, some of these dose response, some of these health effects, they are really hard to figure out. But the fact is, there's a curly-headed little girl somewhere in the future that lives near the Columbia River, who was born without any arms, 
and her mother died of cancer. Is there something that we didn't do today that caused that? That's the kind of nightmares I want the DOE folks to get. Because if they'll start having those nightmares, they're going to have the heart that is part of what they need to solve the problem. And right now, what they're after is minimum compliance to regulations instead of having heart. Minimum compliance with regulations that fail to address the way you live, the way the Native Americans live, the way the Hispanic farm worker lives in the area, the way the Asian subculture lives, the regulations, the EPA regulations, the best our environmental regulations have to offer are completely numb to the peculiarities of the way we live. These are the people along the river. And the regulations are not sensitive to the way they live. And yet, what he hammered's going, it's a minimum compliance with those regulations. Today's decisions are going to determine tomorrow's effects. We need some folks to have some nightmares. We don't need panic now. We don't need alarmist actions now. We need careful, thoughtful reflection now. But it needs to be driven by some heart, some concern for what's coming. 99% okay. of this stuff is still there. And depending upon how it's handled, depending on how it's isolated, it's coming. And it's coming down the river. Because once Hanford cleanup is through, the only pathway for that stuff to move is down the river. The river is where Hanford's coming. People who are not concerned about Hanford because it's not fun to think about don't realize that Hanford's coming down the river at their grandkids. Okay. So that's point one about what's, what's blocking progress at Hanford. Uh, Hanford has lost heart. People are caught up in our society. They're busy. They go home tired. They work 60-hour weeks just to maybe get minimum compliance with regulations. Okay. Uh, that's got to change. Now, there's a second thing that's wrong at Hanford that's blocking progress on getting this place cleaned up. And I'm going to put a label on it, but I want you to be very, very careful to hear what I mean about this label. The problem is competence. Be careful. So an earlier speaker said that there are more PhDs per capita in the Tri-Cities, Hanford area than there are anywhere else in the nation. That's true. There are an incredible number of very bright and I want, to, I want to come into you, very conscientious people, far, probably far more than you have any idea, are as concerned about this thing as you are. Well, then how can I stand here and talk about competence? You see, in today's society and education, it seems like the more knowledgeable and the more capable one gets, it applies to a smaller and smaller and smaller area of focus. Thought about that before? So well, then what happens if the problem to be solved is not smaller and smaller and smaller, but is more and more and more complex? And that's what we've got at Hanford. We have an enormously complex problem being worked on by people who are very bright and very conscientious and very tightly focused. They cannot see what they need to do because they don't have a grip on the big picture. And there's no leadership to give them a grip on the big picture. There's no competence, there's no experience to, to explain to them that what they do has to be compatible with what the guy next to them is doing. And what is that compatibility? What is that interface? And that's not happening. There is little to no, virtually no experience at Hanford on large complex problems. We have brought in people from uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory that have for years worked on NASA projects, Apollo program and so on. Deputy directors of JPL who have spent time at Hanford. 
And they have said that in their judgment, the problem to be solved at Hanford is on a par with the Apollo program in complexity. The Apollo program, the Man on the Moon program. And yet we don't begin to have the people who are equipped to deal with complex problems. That's what I mean by competence. And that's got to be solved. I don't care how, how much heart there is, I don't care how bright the people, if they can't deal with the problem as a complex problem, it isn't going to get solved. So the two things, no heart and no feel for the complexity of the problem. That's what's blocking progress at Hanford. I, um, I want to tack on a sidebar before I turn my note page over. Somebody, uh, okay, yeah, I've only got another 30 minutes left here. <laughs> um, when it's trouble, when there's trouble making progress on a highly controversial problem like Hanford, one does what one can to put their best foot forward. Ah, we all do it. Okay, I do it. You do it. But when all one can do is work on making look good what that best foot forward is, when that becomes an art form, it's called spin doctoring. Okay? And when it really gets to be advanced, somebody does a movie like Wag the Dog. Folks, that's where we are at Hanford. This problem has become so complex and so convoluted and under so much pressure that the only thing that can be done competently is to create the illusion that things are going well. Right now, you've got expert action, work, progress on spin doctoring instead of waste cleanup. Okay. I guess I've got to move on faster. There's something about a schedule here. I want you to think as you pick and choose what you're going to do in the future on two things about Hanford. One is that there's a lot of work that poses a clear and imminent danger. I'm not going to go into those. Dirk touched on the, the uh, spent fuel in the K basins. Nobody should do anything to slow that down. So when we get to the point, as I'm going to in a minute, and recommend that there's some things that ought to be blocked and stopped, I'm not talking about those things. The K-Basin fuel, there are other things. There's chrome. There's strontium-90 entering the river now. Uh, the, this, the latest studies we've got and the only studies we've got indicate that the river is not good below Priest Rapids, where Hanford starts, and above Richland. But below Richland, except for some sediments behind McNary Dam, river's okay, probably, maybe, hopefully. Okay. But there is a harbinger of what's to come. It's the chrome. The chrome that was used as part of the cooling water went through the reactors. The chrome and the strontium-90 are creeping into the river the same way that stuff that gets out of tanks 100 years from now, the same way that other things are going to get into the river. Right now, the chrome is doing great damage to the fish, and you've already, I don't need to repeat what you've heard from folks about the criticality of the Hanford Reach on salmon. And we know that a lot of that chrome is oozing up through the the, uh, the floor of the river right through salmon spawning beds. What we don't know is what is it doing to the salmon? We know it's a lot more than the, the little smolts, the little tiny salmon can stand, but we don't know what, it, what it's really doing to them. So it's a harbinger. It represents the center of the culture of a lot of people, and yet it's being damaged. So Hanford today is damaging culture. We don't know that Hanford today, now in the past maybe, we don't know that Hanford today is, is causing health effects, but we know it's causing cultural effects because we know it's killing salmon. Now is that a harbinger of stuff to come? I think would be foolish not to view it as such. But there is the things that are going on today that represent a clear and imminent danger, and nobody should ever consider doing anything but trying to accelerate those. However, 
the most of what's going on is worrying about how to keep this other 99% of the stuff bottled up. What do we do with the waste in the tanks? What do we do with the buried waste and so on? That bears some looking into because I want to tell you that without some kind of an, of an estimate of the effects of a closed, completed, a cleaned up Hanford, uh, a, a, a what is Hanford when they're all done and how is it going to affect the region without some kind of, of effects estimate of that, there's no way to tell that the decision making that's going on and everything else is correct. Okay, I'll speed up. Come kick me if I take too long. We've got to have an effects estimate. I, I, don't, I don't care whether it's cleaning up Hanford or what the problem is. If you don't have a way of estimating the consequences of one's decisions, you don't know what decisions to make, folks. That's not rocket science. That's not PhD work. If I'm going to write a check, I want to look at my checkbook and see what the effects are going to have. DOE doesn't want to do that. It's far easier to do a minimum compliance with regulations. If they have to do an effects assessment, it might show that maybe the regulations don't really address the problem. The core to what needs to be done right now is an honest, believable effects assessment of a post-closure Hanford. Then we know what things need to be done to close Hanford. But there's no way to know the effectiveness of glass to put waste in from the tanks or th there's no way to know how effective that's going to be at protecting your grandchildren and looking after the concerns of that curly-headed little girl without some way of getting an effects assessment. Uh, I and, and others, Greg DeBruler back there is presently the chair of the uh, team of, of tribal nations and Oregon and EPA, no, nope, sorry, EPA backed out. Uh, Washington Ecology, Hanford Advisory Board. Greg chairs the team that's been trying to put together what would be an acceptable effects assessment. So far it's called the Columbia River Comprehensive Impact Assessment. And whatever you do, support Greg. That has got to hold DOE's feet to the fire because if you folks don't accept the assessment, then you shouldn't accept the decisions being made either. Which brings me to my, one of my paramount recommendations as I try to conclude faster than I wanted to conclude because people are holding up these signs that say the time's up. <laughs> DOE for three years has tried to avoid funding the Columbia River Comprehensive Impact Assessment, an assessment that was developed as an acceptable, this is what would be acceptable DOE, if you'll truly evaluate the river, do, if you do this, then it'll be ac acceptable to all of us, all of us potentially affected people. For three years, DOE has stonewalled us, has done everything in the book to avoid funding it. They finally have got a, a, a project going now that's not called the Columbia River Comprehensive Impact Assessment. It's called the Groundwater Vados Program because they had to do something when tank waste was found in the groundwater, so let's study the groundwater. But slowly, 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 that is being turned and rescoped to really be the comprehensive river assessment it should have been, effects assessment. You have got to make sure they do it. You have got to make sure they fund it. The latest funding announcements yesterday indicate that money seems like it's going there, but when you look at where it's really going, it's not going to the assessment. It's going to peripheral stuff that is not going to get an assessment. It's going to fund laboratories. It's going to fund other things. It's not going to get an effects assessment. And I suggest to you that if they don't fund the assessment, you should take steps to stop court injunctions, whatever, stop some of the work for which there's no basis to proceed because they don't know what the effects of that work's going to be. That you can do, and that they will listen to. There is much work that you can stop without further endangering salmon, without further endangering the river. It all has to do with the containment of the stuff that's yet to come. They've got to fund an assessment. Why? <laughs>
Well, because if they had an honest effects assessment, they would have to get an honest definition of how they're going to leave the Hanford site when they're all done. Would you mean tell me that after, since 1989, in this big multi-billion dollar cleanup project, that there is no definition of how they intend to leave the site when they're done with the cleanup? That's absolutely right. There is no definition of how they intend to leave the site when they're done. Why? I don't know. I do know that if you make the target big enough, it's sure easy to hit. And right now, they have a target as big as a barn on what they need to do to proclaim that they're done. There is no definition of the characteristics, the attributes, the safety, the risk, the extent of contaminants, the degree to which they're isolated of Hanford when they're all done. There is no such definition. Now, if there was such a definition, think about it. I love Russell's lawyer joke. The only thing is, it's not a lawyer joke the way he tells it, it's an engineer joke. If they had such a definition, the, the DOE lawyers, I'm sure, are advising the DOE senior management. If they had such a definition of Hanford's in state, then the problem is that they might have to deliver that. Hanford in state in accordance with that definition instead of a minimum compliance with regulations that were never ever intended to address a Hanford. RECRA, CERCLA were never ever even conceived, much less specifically written down to address a Hanford. If they had a defined in state, You might have to meet that, because you might make them meet that, because you might be worried about a curly-headed little girl that maybe might get born without arms. So DOE doesn't want to write down the nature of the Hanford lands when they're done. Make them write it down. Enter into a joint effort to make them write it down. They've got this thing called land use. Had this, had this group of folks like you and me sit down here several years ago and a thing called a Hanford Land Use Working Group, Future Land Use Working Group. And, and the reasoning was that if we, can, if we can figure out, we can guess at how Hanford might be going to be used, then we would know the extent of the cleanup. Of course, this area is bad over here. That could never be used for anything. So we're going to put a fence around that, and we're going to put up some markers and uh, use institutional controls to keep people out of there. But other than that, how are we going to use Hanford? Now, I want you to think real hard. There's, some, there's, a, there's a fundamental short circuit in thinking here. First of all, land use planning only covers 50 years. You mean, you mean somebody can really? estimate with validity how land is going to get used in the next 50 years? Oh, oh, oh wait a minute. Um, what's the half-life of plutonium? Um, it, it's 123,000 years. What in the world does 50 years of land use have to do with these contaminants? Throw the land use stuff out. DOE is about to release something called a Hanford Remediation Action Environmental Impact Statement. It is nothing but a land use idea. If it becomes a record of decision, it will be a legally enforceable document. It will violate treaties. It will put the Hanford cleanup on the basis of land use for 50 years. Folks, it doesn't pass the giggle test. Stop it. and stop the notion of institutional controls. We've got waste that lasts far beyond governments. What in the world are we talking about, a government providing guards and fences for 50,000 years? Doesn't pass the giggle test. Stop it. <laughs>
If they don't have heart, then you've got to provide the heart. There's got to be a better way to estimate what we should do. And the secret lies in a regional effects assessment and a definition of end states. And with those two things, what's going to happen is people are going to thoughtfully look at the regulation and say, wait a minute, maybe these aren't good enough. Which is step three, you see. Effects assessment, in-state definition, re-examination of the regulations. Now, if you re re, uh, reflect on the regulations and the people that write them, then you'd be forced to reflect on the members of the Tri-Party Agreement. Tri-Party Agreement consists of the Department of Energy, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Washington Department of Ecology, regulators and DOE. Regulators are there because of the regulations, not because they are the potentially affected people. You are the potentially affected people. Why aren't you a part of the binding agreement on how Hanford ought to be cleaned up? Go after it. You have all of the rational argument in the world to go after it. Get this thing back on track. I guess there's a, a concluding remark, and then I'm way past my time, and I'll sit down. Action is needed, but thoughtful, reflective, credible, professional action is needed. I don't, I don't think that marches in the streets going to help us. What's got to, what's got to wind up is a group of thoughtfully concerned people with heart, with nightmares of curly-headed little girls, have got to sit down constructively with those who have got the authority to do something and say, now let's constructively do something. And if those who are in authority don't want to be constructive, then those individuals need to be replaced. I know that there's a lot of you, and I, and I risk your ire by suggesting this, but there's a lot of you that would like to see the Department of Energy removed entirely. I don't oppose that, but I, I, I worry about it because, you see, another agency's got to replace them. And I know that that other agency's got to go somewhere to hire people. And I know that other agency is going to go right back and hire most of the same people that are there now. And we have not then solved the problem. What we have to do is infuse some heart into the people that are there and do it constructively. I'm getting all kinds of time signs. I, I thank you for, for putting up with me. Um, I bid you blessings and goodwill and lots of luck and hang in there. So I, I think it can be fairly said you got your money's worth out of Tom in his last day. <laughs> anyway, we have a few minutes uh, for questions. Uh, Jerry, as the race of the microphones begins. Um, we've heard quite a bit about the chromium threat to salmonids uh, and the last wonderful natural spawning grounds on the Columbia. Uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, NMFS, has designated the Upper Columbia Steelhead, I believe, uh, maybe Glenn can fill us in on this, as uh, endangered. And if that includes the Hanford Reach, uh, perhaps panelists can comment on whether or not we have a new tool for forcing real action for cleanup in terms of chromium and strontium-90, et cetera, since NMFS is empowered to do biological opinions which are binding on federal agencies and prevent any further harm to the population through habitat and require immediate corrective action plans. 
So I'd like to ask about that as a potential new t powerful tool for us all to use. Is this on? The answer is yes, and we're starting research on Monday. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a very good point. And we may well bring that suit. Consider us possible Yeah. <laughs> I, I got to get in one word in comment to Tom because the ex, the expertise that's brought into Hanford is a remarkable uh, achievement of uh, bumbling bureaucracy, and I'm reminded of Niels Bohr's definition of the expert, a famous physicist, in fact one of the founders of nuclear physics. He says someone who has made every conceivable mistake in a very limited field. So I th <laughs> think that's what led to the problem that we have now. I just want to make another comment to Tom Woods' um, uh, talk about his little granddaughter. Uh, I've heard about his little granddaughter before. Uh, we lost a mutated baby this year, too, in my family, and to genetics, and so it started in our family. And I want everybody to remember that there's a generation before this that's already affected, and we don't want to forget about them. Okay. Any other questions? If I could. If I could, one more with Jerry's question. Sure. Um, in the area where the end springs is discharging into the river, the salmonids are not directly there. In the area where the chrome is discharging into the river, the salmonids are there. They're spawning. There's some question even about up in the end springs area, particularly because they've now found steelhead reds that they hadn't found before in a large number of areas of the river. But one of the comments that I heard from one of the scientists I, I found particularly peculiar was that the chrome is at levels coming up into the bottom of the river, which is above the levels, which will kill the fry, the, the small alvin. And that's of great concern. But the comment was that, well, it didn't seem to be an issue because the salmon seemed to be avoiding it and nesting places other than where it was coming into the river. And I think that goes partly into what Jerry's question was, because if the consequences of what's happening are moving the salmon, even through their own actions to protect themselves. It is an impact. It causes them to nest in places that are perhaps less ideal than they might have otherwise liked. And it is fortunate, I think, the folks at Hanford are doing some very good work trying to eliminate the chrome in a project that's in that area. And it may succeed quite well, but any of those projects have their own risks, so that they may cause a consequence they didn't expect. So they're working on it. And I think it's important that they do so. And it is true that the salmon and the steelhead are another aspect that's going to be very important in getting the cleanup moving. Another question about the fish. If, if I understood Glenn correctly, um, we don't know what the impacts are right now on the fish of the pollutants. Uh, I was just wondering, why not? Hasn't anyone? examine some of these fish? Is, is it that hard to see the effects? Well, I'm, I'm not familiar with all the studies. I think it needs yeah. to be emphasized that there are hot spots and there are specific impacts. There's no broad range impact yet. And that's my concern. That is a yet with an unknown time frame, depending on what happens with the cleanup. Uh, obviously, there's more ongoing work on it. We're going to start pushing for more of these studies in this direction. You know, chrome is not radioactive necessarily, but it's a poison, as many heavy metals are. And there are other things besides radioactive materials that can and do leak out, leach into the river system that are of a concern. And, and there hasn't been enough study, but the studies that have been done are enough upon which to base some actions. And there, there has been some study attempted. Unfortunately, it didn't come to fruition. Uh, two years ago, the Hanford Natural Resource Trustee Council, a group that has legal responsibility to ensure that the natural resources are taken care of when there's been a, a, a Superfund release, ended up pressing and DOE in conjunction with Pacific Northwest National Labs went out into the river to measure what the strontium actually was in some detailed cross sections and to look at it actually in the gravels themselves to see if it was of danger to the salmon. At the same time, part of that plan was a plan, and they had the permits to go do it, to actually gather some of the alvins and others and find out what's happening to the fish. 
they managed to get the data for what the strontium was in the gravels in the river, but before they could get to the spawned salmon and get to some of the alvin, the river level increased to a higher stage to the point they couldn't get there. And so unfortunately they tried to do the work, they weren't able to complete it, and the money has not been there since to repeat that. So no one has actually dissected some fish and looked for effects? Not for that specific problem. Remember, we're not talking about acute toxic effects. We're talking about long-term chronological, uh, you know, chronic effects. And that's a lot more subtle. Yeah. Uh, yeah, concerning the, um, the uh, concerns about the chromium in the river, um, in one of Hanford's 1963 documents, they, they were discussing just increases in the uh, sodium, I, I mean, in the chromium and in the um, sulfuric acid and um, uh, one other thing, okay, aluminum. Just the increases by changing some of their uh, water treatment for the, the cooling uh, facilities. And this isn't the primary amount going into the river, but at that point in time, the increases alone uh, on cr hexavalent chromium were um, about 224 tons per year. That was only the increase. The actual input output per year from those six reactors was up close to a thousand tons of hexavalent chromium. Now that's in their own document. Mm -hmm. it's, I've, I've got a little 13-page handout that gives the document number, and I even quote the document. So we're looking at over a thousand tons a year of the most toxic, one of the most toxic chemicals known to man or uh, elements. And then another one of their documents states that by the time, we'll just look at the chromium sulfuric acid, we're looking at uh, several thousand tons, about 8,000, 9,000 tons per year being discharged into the river. Yeah, by let, the time it reached- Let's you and I sit down yeah. over lunch and look at those documents. Right, right by the see. time it reached Richland, about 30% of the metals had deposited in the riverbed between the reactors in Pasco, I'm sorry, then between Pasco and McNary Dam, an additional uh, another 40 percent, leaving the remaining 70 percent of the chemicals and minerals, the radioactive materials and all, then to go from the McNary Dam area all the way down, you know, into the um, discharge of the Columbia River into uh, the ocean. So when we say we don't know, is it we don't know or maybe we don't want to know? We don't know where to look? We, we know enough. Let's you and I yeah. sit down with the figures because I'll tell you, I'm here to learn as much as anything. And there are a lot of people out here who have a lot more expertise on these areas than I do. You're one yeah. of them. Let's talk. Great. But actually, I do have one minor note. Uh, Tom had made a comment about being concerned about eating bottom fish behind the dam. And I, I'd like to allay that concern a little bit. One of the strange things I found when we started looking at some of the sediment studies was that when the dams went in was about the time the reactors were running hard, and they laid down a lot of the sediment that had a lot of the contamination and, and other things right behind the dam in the slow spot. But that area sediments fairly rapidly. And so a lot of clean sediment or less contaminated sediment at least has been laid down on top. And so there's a layer that's contaminated, but it's fairly deep down. But it does give us some concern about what happens if the Army Corps of Engineers or others dredge those areas and what they do with those dredge spoils. Um, we had a couple of studies done by some grad students at Oregon State University, hoping that we might be able to rule that out as being a problem. So they did some worst case analysis. And unfortunately, what it told us was, if you were able to collect that layer of sediment based on the very limited data that we have, it is a problem. If you actually took it out and put it up on a field someplace in, in that local area and had a farmer and his family live there and grow food on it and eat the food off their own farm, they would be exposed at levels that exceed federal limits today for exposure to the general population. It's unlikely you could have that kind of situation exist, but there is a real concern. Okay, I think we have uh, time for one more question. You okay, I'm, just a comment. Um, my name is Kay Sutherland. I'm from Walla Walla, Washington, um, and I'm a downwinder. Um, we look at the the technical steering panel dose reconstruction study and how badly it was manipulated. Um, the 
technical steering panel only caught the fillet of fish out of the Columbia River. I've never seen a fisherman ever catch just the fillet. Uh, they <laughs> left out the bone, they left out the tail, the gills, the head, the guts, everything. Um, all other projects are based on the technical steering panel dose reconstruction study, including the thyroid study that is now being, uh, what, eight or nine, ten years um, in, into that one. But it's based on the dose technical, uh, the technical steering panel dose reconstruction study. Um, there was an independent analysis done uh, by a Dr. Pickford and it came back highly critical of the dose reconstruction study. So what did Judge McDonald do that is hearing the federal, uh, he's a federal judge, hearing the uh, downwinder litigation, he sealed that independent analysis because it was highly critical of uh, the technical steering panel. So we don't know, and he has never opened up those records for us to learn just exactly what dose we have had. Thank you.